This entry is an interpretation of Alice Walker's 1973 short story, Everyday Use. I'm just going to read the story and comment on it as I go. I've abridged the tale significantly and can only hope I haven't mauled its elegance and insight too severely. You'll have to imagine that my voice is the voice of the narrator, Mrs. Johnson, known as Mama within the story, as she talks about her daughters and her life. I apologize I cannot achieve the rural southern accent with which Mama would speak. The story begins with Mama anticipating the arrival of her daughter Dee, who, with the help of her family and church, has been away at university. Everyday Use I will wait for her in the yard that Maggie and I made so clean and wavy yesterday afternoon. A yard like this is more comfortable than most people know. It's not just a yard. It's like an extended living room when the hard clay is swept clean as a floor and the fine sand around the edges lined with tiny irregular grooves. Anyone can come and sit and look up into the elm tree and wait for the breezes that never come inside the house. Maggie will be nervous until after her sister goes. She will stand hopelessly in corners, homely and ashamed of the burn scars down her arms and legs, eyeing her sister with a mixture of envy and awe. She thinks her sister has held life always in the palm of one hand, that no is a word the world never learned to say to her. Dee is lighter than Maggie, with nicer hair and a fuller figure. She's a woman now, though sometimes I forget. How long ago was it that the other house burned? Ten, twelve years? Sometimes I can still hear the flames and feel Maggie's arms sticking to me, her hair smoking and her dress falling off her in little black papery flakes. Her eyes seemed stretched open, blazed open by the flames reflected in them. And D, I see her standing off under the sweet gum tree she used to dig gum out of, a look of concentration on her face as she watched the last dingy gray board of the house fall in toward the red-hot brick chimney. Why don't you do a dance around the ashes? I wanted to ask her. She had hated the house that much. I used to think she hated Maggie, too, but that was before we raised money, the church and me, to send her to Augusta to school. She used to read to us without pity, forcing words, lies, other folks' habits, whole lives upon us, too, sitting trapped and ignorant underneath her voice. She washed us in a river of make-believe, burned us with a lot of knowledge we didn't necessarily need to know, pressed us to her with the serious way she read, to shove us away at just the moment like dimwits we seemed about to understand. I have deliberately turned my back on the house. It is three rooms, just like the one that burned, except the roof is tin. They don't make shingle roofs anymore. There are no real windows, just some holes cut in the sides, like the portholes in a ship, but not round and not square, with rawhide holding the shutters up on the outside. This house is in a pasture, too, like the other one. No doubt when Dee sees it, she will want to tear it down. She wrote me once that no matter where we choose to live, she will manage to come see us. So I'm going to interrupt now and consider this last line. We've already seen that Mama's daughter Dee has separated herself from her family in many ways, one of which is through her intelligence. Dee attempts to educate her sister and mother, it seems, only to elevate herself above them, to, quote, shove us away at just the moment we seemed about to understand, end quote. And apparently one of the things that this separation has done to Dee herself is to make her oblivious to the economic realities of her family. While Dee was cloistered at university, paid for by Mama and her church, she wrote to her family that she will visit them, quote, no matter where we choose to live. Mama puts quotation marks around this amusing idea that she and Maggie have the wherewithal to pick and choose to live anywhere but the tiny rural home in which they must live. 
D has apparently forgotten where her singular privilege to have economic choices came from in the first place. I'll rejoin the story just as D's car arrives at Mama's house. It is hard to see them clearly through the strong sun, but even the first glimpse of leg out of the car tells me it is D. From the other side of the car comes a short, stocky man. Hair is all over his head, a foot long, and hanging from his chin like a kinky mule tail. Wasuzo Tieno, D says. The short, stocky fellow with the hair to his navel is all grinning and follows up with a Asalamu alaikum, my mother and sister. He moves to hug Maggie, but she falls back, right up against the back of my chair. Don't get up, says D. She turns, showing white heels through her sandals, and goes back to the car. Out she peeks next with a Polaroid. She stoops down quickly and lines up picture after picture of me sitting there in front of the house with Maggie cowering behind me. She never takes a shot without making sure the house is included. When a cow comes nibbling around the edge of the yard, she snaps it and me and Maggie and the house. Then she puts the Polaroid back in the seat of the car and comes up and kisses me on the forehead. I'll interrupt again here to consider this scene, where before she even properly greets or hugs her mother, Dee rushes back to the car for a camera to take pictures. This isn't a moment of a daughter hoping to preserve a scene of family reunion. Dee does not hand the camera to her boyfriend so that she can include herself in any of the photos. Instead, as the story goes out of its way to emphasize that D quote, never takes a shot without making sure the house is included, what we're seeing in D is an anthropologist doing field work. She seems to be capturing and studying the dwelling of a native people in their natural environment. This behavior is a sign of a new orientation in D, a mode of thinking that is new, but by which she still separates herself from her family. The story has suggested that, as a girl, Dee had despised her home as a place of shameful poverty and ignorance. As we will see in the unfolding story, however, the college-educated Dee no longer hates her background. Now she is enthusiastic about her family origins, but only because she has now elevated herself above them, and can now point back to her origin as a sign of her own cultural authenticity. The story continues as Mama greets her daughter. Well, I say, D. No, Mama, she says, not D. Wanjero Liwanika Kemanjo. What happened to D? I wanted to know. She's dead, Wanjero said. I couldn't bear it any longer, being named after the people who oppress me. You know well as me that you was named after your Aunt Deesy, I said. But who was she named after? asked Wanjero. I guess after Grandma D, I said. And who was she named after? asked Wanjero. Her mother, I said, and saw Wanjero was getting tired. That's about as far back as I can trace it, I said though, in fact, I probably could have carried it back beyond the Civil War through the branches. Well, said the boyfriend, there you are. There I was not, I said, before Deesy cropped up in our family, so why should I try to trace it that far back? So, here I'll interrupt again. We find out that D now wants to be called Wanjero, although, to avoid confusion, I'm just going to keep calling her D in my commentary. While away at college, she has clearly become an adherent of some form of black nationalism, possibly the Nation of Islam, which seeks to reclaim black identity through an African culture and history removed from European influence. In this conversation, she is reminding her mother that their given names ultimately derive from the dominant white culture that had instigated slavery in the United States and all its subsequent forms of social and institutional racism. Hence her assertion that she was, quote, named after the people who oppress me. But the only history Mama has in mind in this conversation is their family history, and so she reminds Dee that she was named after her Aunt Deesy, 
D then asks, but who was she named after? Trying to lead her mother back through history to the European origin of the name DC. European, that is, if DC is derived from Dicey, a diminutive of the name Richard. Mama is happy to take this trip into the past, and so reminds her daughter of her grandmother Dee, and even her mother. In fact, Mama's memory is able to trace the family name, quote, back beyond the Civil War. So what we have are two competing ideas of what constitutes the relevant history of Dee's name. To Dee, that history begins in a distant European past that eventually arrives at the early 17th century when slavery first comes to colonial America. To Mama, however, the relevant history begins before the Civil War and is not a broad national history, but one focused on the lived and communicated experience of something more local, a multi-generational family history. I'd like to come back to these competing histories in a moment, but for now I'll go back to the story, skipping ahead a little bit after Mama is told to call the boyfriend Hakim a barber, and the family sits down to dinner. We sat down to eat, and right away he said he didn't eat collards, and pork was unclean. Wanjero, though, went on through the chitlins and cornbread, the greens and everything else. She talked a blue streak over the sweet potatoes. Everything delighted her, even the fact that we still used the benches her daddy made for the table when we couldn't afford to buy chairs. Oh, Mama, she cried, then turned to Hakima Barber. I never knew how lovely these benches are. You can feel the rump prints, she said, running her hands underneath her and along the bench. Then she gave a sigh, and her hand closed over Grandma D's butter dish. That's it, she said. I knew there was something I wanted to ask you if I could have. She jumped up from the table and went over in the corner where the churn stood, the milk in it clabber by now. She looked at the churn and looked at it. This churn top is what I need, she said. Didn't Uncle Buddy whittle it out of a tree y'all used to have? Yes, I said. Uh Uh-huh, she said happily, and I want the dasher too. Uncle Buddy whittle that too, asked the barber. D. Wangero looked up at me. Aunt Dee's first husband whittled the dash, said Maggie, so low you almost couldn't hear her. His name was Henry, but they called him Stash. (laughs) Maggie's brain is like an elephant's, Wanjero said, laughing. Now, here I'll interrupt, while the subjects of naming and history are still on our minds, to point out Dee's amazement that Maggie can remember the names of her extended family. She has only a vague conception of the culture that is constituted by the names and events of her ancestral past, and yet she has become very interested in what she would call the culture that her mother's house and its things represent. Let's go back to the story, where Dee has suddenly taken possession of her mother's old butter churn. I can use the chute top as a centerpiece for the alcove table, she said, sliding a plate over the chute and I'll think of something artistic to do with the dasher. When she finished wrapping the dasher, the handle stuck out. I took it for a moment in my hands. You didn't have to look close to see where hands pushing the dasher up and down to make butter had left a kind of sink in the wood. In fact, there were a lot of small sinks. You could see where thumbs and fingers had sunk into the wood. It was beautiful light yellow wood from a tree that grew in the yard where Big D and Stash had lived. So, to pause again, here we see that when Mama looks at the churn handle, it calls to mind her family and its peculiar history, that history whose names and events are, to D, just a hazy unknown. So what value exactly does D see in this object? It seems to represent for her some kind of quote-unquote genuine cultural authenticity and will act as proof of her connection to that authenticity when she exhibits it in her home. It will artistically decorate her table like an exotic artifact retrieved from foreign lands, much in the same way that people sometimes display on their walls ceremonial masks from South America or Africa without knowing anything about the specific life and history of those specific objects. Back to the story. 
After dinner, D. Wanjero went to the trunk at the foot of my bed and started rifling through it. Maggie hung back in the kitchen over the dishpan. Out came Wanjero with two quilts. They had been pieced by Grandma D., and then Big D. and me had hung them on the quilt frames on the front porch and quilted them. One was in the Lone Star pattern. The other was Walk Around the Mountain. In both of them were scraps of dresses Grandma D. had worn fifty and more years ago. Bits and pieces of Grandpa Gerald's paisley shirts, and one teeny faded blue piece about the size of a penny matchbox that was from great-grandpa Ezra's uniform that he wore in the Civil War. Mama, when Jero said, sweet as a bird, can I have these old quilts? I heard something fall in the kitchen, and a minute later the kitchen door slammed. Why don't you take one or two of the others, I asked. These old things is just done by me and Big D from some tops your grandma pieced before she died. No, said Wanjero, I don't want those. They're stitched around the borders by machine. That'll make them last better, I said. That's not the point, said Wanjero. These are all pieces of dresses Grandma used to wear. She did all this stitching by hand. Imagine. She held the quilt securely in her arms, stroking them. I'll interrupt here again as Dee takes hold of another of her mother's possessions. Both the Lone Star and the Walk Around the Mountain patterns in these weavings remind us of the idea that such quilts with these symbols had been used in the Underground Railroad as signals to guide escaped slaves into northern safety. The scrap of blue cloth that had been part of Grandpa Ezra's Civil War uniform ties this family history into that more detailed 19th century African-American history that holds little interest for Dee because she only wants to think in the broadest terms of global and colonial history. This is why, for Dee, African-American history is simply a story of subjection, the story of a people without any historical agency who have passively inherited the culture of Europe and white America. It is a story that does not see the unique cultural invention that African-Americans have created and woven for generations into their own historical timeline. Dee's broad history cannot see Grandpa Ezra fighting for his family's freedom in the Civil War and cannot see her great-aunt Dee's self-directed labor at the butter churn that sustained and renewed these generations. Let's go back to the story with Mama responding to Dee's request. The truth is, I said, I promise to give them quilts to Maggie for when she marries John Thomas. She gasped like a bee had stung her. Maggie can't appreciate these quilts, she said. She'd probably be backward enough to put them to everyday use. I reckon she would, I said. God knows I've been saving them for long enough with nobody using them. I hope she will. I didn't want to bring up how I had offered Dee Wanjera a quilt when she went away to college. Then she had told me they were old-fashioned, out of style. But they're priceless, she was saying now, furiously, for she has a temper. Maggie would put them on the bed, and in five years they'd be in rags. Less than that. She can always make some more, I said. Maggie knows how to quilt. D. Wanjero looked at me with hatred. You just will not understand. The point is these quilts, these quilts. Well, I said, stumped, what would you do with them? Hang them, she said, as if that was the only thing you could do with quilts. Maggie, by now, was standing in the door. I could almost hear the sound her feet made as they scraped over each other. She can have them, Mama, she said, like someone used to never winning anything or having anything reserved for her. I can remember Grandma D without the quilts. I'll pause the story here. With the previous reminder that, quote, Maggie knows how to quilt, Maggie's own assurance that she can remember her grandmother without any special object makes clear that Maggie embodies a living culture. For D, the quilt will have value only when it has been extracted from everyday use, from its living and ongoing history. For D, it must be appropriated, cut away from its environment and elevated into a removed anthropological sphere, as if preserved in amber, an object that is now dead, 
but which can serve as proof of Dee's connection to that once-living world. And here the story draws us into one of its most important questions. What is the value, meaning, and true purpose of preserving cultural artifacts removed from their everyday use? When we're talking about cultures and peoples who really are gone, like the ancient Mesopotamians, it is easy to see the value of preserving artifacts so that we can carry at least something of that lost culture forward in our memory. But that same impulse we have to preserve is also active when we think of Mama's quilts. It is very difficult not to sympathize with Dee when we first hear her objection that these quilts should be preserved, saved from the destruction they would undergo if put to everyday use. But when we see that doing so would deprive Maggie of an inheritance that will make her happy and comfortable in its everyday use, our sympathy quickly swivels back to Maggie. But even as we reject Dee's apparently self-serving motives for preserving the quilts, we're still hung on the horns of a dilemma. Because we still believe that these quilts have an inherent cultural value, that we should at least recognize and be conscious of them as embodiments of a culture that we do not want to forget and let disappear. Maggie and Mama are not unconscious of any larger value in these quilts, but they don't see the objects as necessary for the preservation of their memory or their way of life. As Maggie says, she can remember her grandmother and her family history without the quilts. Maggie and Mama make no use of the idea of cultural value because that concept is meaningless unless you occupy some space that you believe is outside of that living culture. An outside space that sees this culture as just one possibility among others. We might conclude that the story is suggesting that the true value of a culture does not inhere in its artifacts, but only in the living people that make use of them. And yet, many readers will still harbor a strong feeling that the cloth that had been part of Grandpa Ezra's Civil War uniform should be saved from destruction. Some might point to examples of other living cultures that have had no anthropological impulse to preserve any of its artifacts from everyday use, and as such cultures have developed and changed, their older ways of living slowly disappear into oblivion, leaving the task of exhuming and remembering that history to the anthropological impulse of those who are now outside that lost culture. Part of the story's genius is that it never entirely dissipates the tension of this dilemma. After all, Alice Walker herself was educated and has taught in colleges and universities, institutions that take pride in their mission to preserve cultural memory from around the globe, doing so as outsiders to those cultures. One writer to whom Walker has devoted serious study is Zora Neale Hurston. Hurston is clearly one of Walker's intellectual heroes. At the same time, it is impossible to escape analogies between Hurston and Dee. Like Dee, Hurston was nurtured in the rural South before obtaining a university education. And like Dee, Hurston returned to her humble rural family, but with a new anthropological eye. Hurston became famous partly for what one might call her field memoirs, narrative studies of her own extended family and former neighbors in Florida. These autoethnographic revelations were quite brilliant and enlightening, but they inevitably raised questions about this act of appropriating and preserving these oral artifacts for the consumption of a broader American culture, one that extends so far beyond the small community of Hurston's youth. As these are precisely the questions that Walker's short story directs at D, it is difficult not to see them pertaining to Hurston as well. Alice Walker's groundbreaking fiction was written in the 1970s and 80s. After bringing the author's biography into this reading, I would be remiss if I didn't note more recent developments in her political consciousness as well. Namely, over the past decade, the 74-year-old author has become susceptible to bizarre conspiracy theorists like David Icke. Who knows if this is due to a deterioration or just a newfound laziness in Walker's thinking? But any responsible reader of an author like Ike 
ought to be able to recognize his illogical, ignorant, and anti-Semitic fantasies for what they are. But let's go back to this story, which is clearly not the product of a lazy mind, picking up just after Maggie tells Mama that Dee can take the quilts because she, Maggie, can remember Grandma Dee without them. I looked at her hard. It was Grandma Dee and Big Dee who taught her how to quilt herself. She stood there with her scarred hands hidden in the folds of her skirt. She looked at her sister with something like fear, but she wasn't mad at her. This was Maggie's portion. This was the way she knew God to work. When I looked at her like that, something hit me in the top of my head and ran down to the soles of my feet. Just like when I'm in church and the Spirit of God touches me and I get happy and shout. I did something I'd never done before, hugged Maggie to me, then dragged her on into the room, snatched the quilts out of Miss Wangero's hands, and dumped them into Maggie's lap. Maggie just sat there on my bed with her mouth open. Take one or two of the others, I said to Dee. But she turned without a word and went out to Hakima Barber. You just don't understand, she said, as Maggie and I came out to the car. What don't I understand, I wanted to know. Your heritage, she said. I butt in for the last time here. Heritage, Dee says, as if it answers everything. But we know that this is another contested term, another reminder of the very different ways she and her mother think about the relevant history of their family. But the term also reminds us of the conversations we've heard for over a century about what constitutes the heritage of the American South in general. To this day, there are those who tell us that everything noble and venerable about the South's centuries-old heritage is represented by the Confederate battle flag. From a strictly historical perspective, this conviction is confusing to say the least. Whether we imagine the non-native origins of Southern heritage to be the English province of Carolina, or the Spanish settlements of Florida, or the European settlers of Appalachia, this heritage has grown under many banners, emblems, and flags. What is now called the Confederate flag represents at most four years of that 300-year history. It is no surprise that many people question the motives of those who want to ignore this long and multifaceted heritage and replace it with this meager image. At the close of Walker's story, Dee departs angry at her family's failure to understand their heritage. She put on some sunglasses that hid everything above the tip of her nose and chin. Maggie smiled, maybe at the sunglasses, maybe a real smile, not scared. After we watched the car dust settle, I asked Maggie to bring me a dip of snuff, and then the two of us sat there just enjoying until it was time to go in the house and go to bed.